again, welcome all. This is a meeting that will be held for an hour. This is a meeting that we started because of the uncertainty in the world with the war that's going on in Ukraine and the desperate need of help for experts and clinical uh, care uh, physicians and mental health professionals. And um, we'll do this bi-weekly. This is the first one, it's the 17th of March. And in two weeks, we have another session on this. Two weeks after that, we'll do another one. And we'll do two things. A clinical case will be presented and expert opinion will be shared amongst the attendees the rest today. Thank you, Bob, for being with us. And um, may I give you may I give you the floor? Thank you, Eric, Garina, and Joseph. And let me introduce my colleague and close friend, David Benedict. Uh, David is the chair of our Department of Psychiatry, um, retired Army officer who both has served in deployed capacities and uh, works very closely around the issues of disaster and trauma response. So I look forward to the two of us commenting a bit back and forth and hopefully responding to any questions or comments. Maybe, maybe you can raise your voice, David, that we know that you're here. I can I'm see here you. And I, I, I didn't want to interrupt my friend Bob, but I am definitely here and, and happy to be a part of this conversation. Good to see you, David. Good to see you. So David is always on, and I would encourage you all to think about, we, we often create what we call thought groups. Um, a thought group can be actually meeting in person, but more often is actually an email stream in which we put on uh, two, three, four, five, usually not a dozen, but of our friends who in fact help educate us and keep us grounded. And uh, in that group, and David is nearly always in any thought group I bring up, uh, it is the opportunity to educate each other about things we may know and have forgotten or about things we don't know at all. Uh, and it's a way to stay in touch. So uh, please remember that uh, email is not only a back and forth, it can be an opportunity to think together, in particular around challenging cases. Um, the clinical issues of staying grounded when one's doing clinical work so that you don't get lost, lost in the patient, or in this case, lost in the environment that is so chaotic. And one, several ways we do that. One is of course, by taking a break. And uh, when possible, we like to talk about horizon therapy, which means go and look out the window and look as far distant as you can and enjoy the fact that the, you have distant vision and not only dis distance to a screen that may be just a foot in front of you, and then secondly, the issue of talking with someone and that talking by email. There is nothing better than being able to reach out to someone. So I very much salute Eric and Arena and Joseph for setting this up. It in many ways is reminiscent for an example that we've referred to, David and I often, following the Armenian earthquake in which uh, a number of universities set up what was then a space called a space bridge, which was a satellite connection into our media, a satellite time donated by NASA. Right now it'd have to be by, I guess, Elon Musk, um, but allowed uh, on real time consultation. Um, our university was involved in psychiatric consultation, which I think was on Mondays and Wednesdays. Someone else was involved in surgical consultation, which was on other days, but it allowed for clinicians to talk to each other. And when you are engaged in such challenging work, it is so important to have someone to touch base and feel grounded with. So with that in mind, let me first, um, I put in the chat and I will send out the link to our website, cstsonline.org. And please uh, feel free to go there. Everything that's there is in the public domain. Use it in any way that's helpful to you. Copy it, paste it, change it, read it, make it your own. Um, the, uh, we've recently had several discussions in most uh, uh, yesterday or so, I think David with Facebook, uh, who are also making use of those materials. Um, most of them are translated into Ukrainian, uh, th thanks to Arena and others. And they are also being translated into Russian and Polish as well. They are also have to be translated into Japanese uh, because we have Japanese colleagues who are also working to assist and help. 
So no matter what we talk about, there's a lot there to look at and whatever we forget, a good portion of it is there. <clears throat> so let me comment for a few minutes, then I'll pass to Dave and then we can kind of Dave bounce off of whatever each other's brought up that reminds us of something. So when thinking of those who are presently fighting and keeping in mind that some of those are professional military and some are not, there really is a difference in training. Training is best thought of as resilience building, that that's what it's about in the military, that training decreases one's sense of fear and increases one's sense of being collect connected to those around you. Cohesion, which is a term frequently used, certainly in the military, perhaps not often as often on the civilian side, but it really represents feeling one as a part of a group. That is perhaps the number one piece of resilience. The one factor that is shown to predict resilience over time in nearly all studies is one's supports and the degree of support that one sustains. So when in doubt, talk about how do I connect people? That's particularly true for those who are fighting. Can I connect them to those who are also fighting with them so they have shared experiences that they can talk about in ways that maybe they can't share with others because they can't make the same joke that they would want to make because it would be seen as off-putting. But in fact, that joke may be part of joining together in a difficult time and setting, connecting with those who are doing the same thing. And then there is connecting to one's family and friends, challenging. One, can it happen, but it brings positive experiences, connecting to one's family who may be outside the Ukraine, but it also brings nostalgia and sadness and longing. So one has to be able to connect outside, but then reconnect back in. <clears throat> so if one encourages the connection out, be sure also to encourage the connection back in so that one is again put within the armor of one's friends, which is part of our resilience. It is by joining a group that we sustain ourselves over time. Secondly, I would comment about the importance of calming. And many of you will recognize, as we frequently do in our work at CSDS and other places, we build greatly on the principles of psychological first aid because they have a wonderful evidence base. But calming, even in the face of combat, is critically important. How does one calm? So one might say, oh, let's teach them how to do progressive muscle relaxation. Eh, that's our language. That's not their language. It's not the time to learn a new skill as much as to recall what helped you before to calm. So in talking with someone, I wouldn't begin with teaching a new way to calm. I would begin with how have you calmed in the past? And then I would look for simple ways before I'd go to our more complicated ways of calming. Simple ways can include if you were in a, with a colleague, a friend, a co-fighter, can you sit near each other? Can you give each other a hug, which is so common and often forgotten as a way to calm each other in such settings? If you're dealing with a family or another setting, rather than progressive relaxation, spouses or partners or friends holding hands can in fact calm much more powerfully than going through progressive muscle relaxation. Another aspect of calming is this issue of grounding. And I was very struck, I forget Dave where we saw it, but uh, we certainly jumped on it, of the idea of feel one's feet uh, was a phrase that was used by a Ukrainian colleague that we saw. I don't know, Rina, if you sent that or someone did. And I thought, what a wonderful idea, uh, because it both says, find where you are solid and feel it. So it has a wonderful metaphor, as well as actually a physiologic element. 
Feel your feet. Don't just stand on them. Feel them and feel yourself connected to the ground. These are just my examples. I'm sure you have your own of issues of calming. Then I would add a picture of dealing with grief because it touches on a bit of what Dimitrov had mentioned. Um, grief and sadness is also a part of, part of combat and war for those who are fighting as well as those who are not. Recovery from grief can be a rapid process in which one puts it out of one's mind, which can be critically important, as well as the slow process of healing. When in combat, the issue of rapid recovery is frequently what's most important and recognizing you will deal with it later. And saying those words to someone who's leading a team or to the team members can aid them in saying, I'm not forgetting the person that I'm stopping grieving about. I'm saying, I will do it again later to help them reorient to the present in which they need to be able to respond and react rather than become immersed in feelings that might overwhelm them. That doesn't mean don't let the feelings happen but don't leave the person with the feelings when you hang up or stop. Help them come back to the environment in which they have to be able to respond. Another piece of grieving, and then Dave, I'll pass to you. Um, and Dave knows this well, has operationalized it, and we've used it with many organizations, is the question of grief leadership. There are important roles for leaders, whether that leader is the head of a platoon or a squad or the mayor of a city, that part of grief is being able to say, you feel it also. That allows those around you to express their grief. That may happen in a brief period of time. Yes, I miss him also. Or it can be a recovery process for a city and a nation over time. But remembering that leaders have special roles of not just dealing with their own grief, but also making it normal to experience grief for all those around them. To say, I feel it also, I can cry with you. Now let's get back to work. David, you wanna pick up on sure. some thoughts? Yes, thank before, you. Before, before, thoughts, before you go there, Dave, because I didn't even properly introduce uh, Bob, neither did I, Dave, but for the audience to know, both Dave Benedict and Bob Persano are both affiliated as professor at psych of psychiatry and neuroscience at the Uniform Services University in Bethesda in Maryland. And that's good for now. You can read it on the web, but I wanted to make, because of the recording, known that, that that's your, um, that's your uh, profession and that you're affiliated. Thanks, Eric. So please go ahead, Dave. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, and Bob, uh, I will try to sort of expand on a couple of the things that you mentioned. You, you noted that um, as we think about um, uh, addressing um, distress and distress reactions in, in acute situations like war, we've, we lean on the principles of psychological first aid. And you mentioned, uh, importantly, uh, the first two, connectedness and calming. Um, and I think those are the first two of five uh, the other ones worthy of mentioning are um, the ability to, to uh, facilitate some notion of hope or optimism, even in difficult situations. So looking to the future, and again, not expressing sort of a Pollyannish, Pollyanna-ish, everything is going to be okay, but there will be a better day, and there will be a better uh, tomorrow is an important aspect of psychological first aid. So hope and optimism. Another is uh, empowering people, giving people a sense of their uh, capacity to help themselves. So building on a sense of efficacy, which is also very important um, uh, to, to a psych uh, an important element of psychological first aid. So what can you do to help yourself be calm is a way of, of, of promoting efficacy and calmness at the same time. Let's not me try to teach you something, but let's rely on your strengths to help you in this circumstance. Um, and I think that's an important one. The, the most difficult one, perhaps, in an uh, operational, in a combat environment, is promoting a sense of safety. Um, that, that is obviously very difficult when shells are falling, uh, when, uh, when 
bullets are flying. But if you are trying to uh, attempting to work with a service member, you can at least try to establish a sense of safety in the here and now. Where we are right now is a safe place. You are away from the fire. We are trying to uh, help you get back into a fighting mode, but right now we're safe. So safety, efficacy, connectedness, calmness, hope are the principles of, of psychological first aid. I think those are things to remember. Uh, they overlap, obviously. And then in terms of addressing uh, service members, the focus again is on uh, returning folks to the mission. So a lot of uh, the things that Bob mentioned are ways of sort of uh, um, trying to uh, uh, give people permission to feel things, but then move back into the here and now. And, and the notion of some of the notions of combat and operational stress control include certainly treating people close to the action so they can get back in, proximity, immediacy, identifying a person who's in acute distress and assisting them as quickly as possible, um, expectancy a notion that people, the feelings that one has when one is subjected to awful trauma are, are normal and soldiers get them and, nor, and regular civilians get them. And I think perhaps when it's civilians that have become soldiers, they might feel as if, boy, I, I shouldn't be like this because I'm a soldier now. Everybody has fear, everybody has grief, everybody has sorrow. And so it, the, the tell, uh, reminding folks that the, their emotional experience is uh, understandable under the circumstances and normal is, is part of uh, sort of uh, um, uh, helping them return to the, the fighting force, if you will. And then simplicity. Uh, the other major principle is there's no time for uh, <laughs> prolonged psychodynamic psychotherapy. There's no, long, no time to start writing down homework for cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, these are simple things. What we need right now is a little bit of rest. What we read night, need right now is a little bit of sleep, a little bit of food, uh, perhaps a chance to, if it's at all possible, connect with others, uh, connect with loved ones if it's at all possible. And we have to think, I think, in these environments about what mechanisms are available for communication. Uh, my understanding is that um, cellular networks come and go, uh, perhaps internet is available, but not all the time, but uh, some opportunity using whatever mechanisms possible to connect to include, I, maybe even old fashioned, I'm going to take my break here and write a letter in the hope that it will uh, reach my family. I think these are sort of um, important elements to consider in the, in the uh, environment of trying to manage and help people in, in acute situations. Um, one of the uh, um, possibilities, of course, for service members and, and for others is, is a, a acute stress reaction. And acute stress reaction, a, a dissociative kind of a phenomenon, sometimes dissociative, but a, a, a paralyzing reaction. And there are some a actual steps that one can take to pull somebody out of those situations and, again, restore them quickly to the, to the uh, mission at hand. And uh, I, I won't take credit for them. Uh, I believe it was the Israelis that came up with the principles of eye cover, which are first to identify uh, such a reaction, second to connect with the person right out of a psychological first aid, um, to offer uh, um, uh, assistance. I'm going to help you here, and uh, is a, is the third step uh, to so, sort of verify the facts. Uh, here's what happened. Here's how we see you now by asking some questions, and and then to uh, um, uh, uh, return them to the to the mission. Here's what we by by saying. Here's what we have to do now. We have to get back out there. Uh, um, we have to uh, try to defend our our hospital or, or what have you. So and those can be looked up. I don't have them in front of me, but the notion of eye cover as a as a response as an intervention for an acute stress reaction is one to keep in mind, um, along with these principles of proximity, immediacy, simplicity, and expectancy. You're going to get better as we uh, go forward and, and we think a little bit about uh, trying to do the simple things that establish psychological first aid in a very difficult environment. I don't know, if, uh, Bob, if, if those ideas uh, resonate with you or give you other thoughts or how we are on time for that matter. 
Yeah, <clears throat> just to echo the eye cover, and I was hoping you'd bring that up. And I forget, Dave, is it E Y E or I? But there's I C O V E R. Right, right. <laughs> so and the it, I, there's yeah, a wonderful video. Yeah, yeah. On, uh, the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, working with our Israeli colleagues, really. Um, one of the striking things of it, and you can apply it in the civilian setting as well, where at least my experience is the civilians may more likely have a strong emotional reaction rather than acute dissociative reaction. But literally one of the important pieces in either setting is to hold the person, make physical contact if you can, and in the military setting, it becomes particularly important if it's a dissociative reaction, because that can help them bring it out of it. But the physical contact to, in fact, look at me, look at me, to help them, again, come back to the present, whether it's an overwhelming emotional response or truly a dissociative reaction. You may find that in dealing with someone that you're on Zoom with. And the question becomes, how will you try and pull them out? I haven't thought one, that one through. It's a good question. Um, but it's one to teach to service members so that they can care for each other. It's one of the aspects of, as, as Dave would frequently remind me, buddy care, uh, which we've now deployed in response to COVID, let alone war, which is where it derives from. But the issue of caring for each other and learning, not only learning how to apply a tourniquet, which I want to say, I hope it is out there. Stop the Bleed is a wonderful tool. Don't know if you all have it. It was actually developed at the university. It's essentially a tourniquet, um, but it's easily applied, rapidly applied, life-saving. Our whole vision of how we use tourniquets has changed. Those of you as old as I will remember tourniquets were never to be applied. Wrong. Tourniquets are now always to be applied. And it's the first step of establishing safety and potentially saving someone's life before you worry about saving their mental health. Um, David, any quick comments? Maybe we'll turn it back to Eric. To... Yeah, only to echo the, the notion of buddy care, another principle of, of well-deployed throughout sort of the military uh, health and mental health environment and operational environment is the notion that everybody should have a battle buddy, that somebody is gonna be watching his or her back and, and of course, that person can be selected by the command or can be self-identified and can be changed, but everybody should know that somebody's out there watching, uh, watching for them in, as individuals. Uh, and so that's a, another sort of thing that I think is a, an important component of, of providing a structure for sort of basic needs, basic emotional and mental health needs being met in a combat environment and, and worth sort of reminding leaders. And then the only other thing I would point out, or, or maybe it goes without saying, is that it is really different, um, and, and the vulnerabilities are different for civilians or new people to any unit. So the challenges of sort of these uh, uh, immediately or, or rapidly assembled now fighting teams are very uh, different than well-oiled machines. Uh, and, and new people or people who are new to an otherwise established team are at particular risk and should be um, uh, we should keep an eye out for the challenges that, uh, that, that might befall a person who is new to an otherwise well-established uh, fighting unit or group who didn't even use to fight together, but uh, some group that worked together and is now a fighting unit. So just things to think about as a provider in a combat, oper in a combat environment. Um, I, I mean, I think that's a pretty good place to sort of go for a, a quick, discussion. Quick digest. Well, thank Back you. to you, Eric. Thank you for that wisdom. And, and I'm sure we have lots of people that um, are calling in from Ukraine are in dire need of, of hearing these wise words and getting that psychological aid and consume it. It's a density of information. Now, I may have a flurry of questions, maybe just one that I would like to throw at you is this has been going on for already a couple of days and it may go on for much, much longer. How important, how you address sleep as an issue? Could you say a little bit about sleep and how to deal with the, the necessity to recover or to actually refresh yourself? And, and you don't want to sleep because something may happen as you're falling asleep. So you miss any notions? So uh, let me make the generic comment and Dave fill in. Uh, we should have said sleep. You are obviously, Eric, thank you for teeing it up. 
of all the things one can do, sleep is perhaps the most important and at times the hardest to accomplish. We know, in fact, lots of studies show uh, at this point, including ones we have done, that insomnia prior to deploying to a war environment increases your risk for PTSD. Lack of sleep during operational events decreases your functional capacity as well as decreases your ability to manage your emotions. The question of how to sustain sleep. At times, there are several things you can think about. One, rotating sh shift work in which someone provides safety while others sleep. Now, clearly that usually happens. Somebody's awake and somebody's asleep. But saying out loud, I will protect you, it's time for you to sleep, and then switch it around. Because one of the things that doesn't allow for sleep is not being calm. Secondly, is the question of intrusive nightmares. We hope to actually to have up on our website shortly, rapid work with nightmares, because nightmares can both disrupt your sleep, but also make you frightened of going to sleep. Telling about the nightmare to someone can be very relieving. Secondly, realizing you can change the dream and think about how you would want it to end can be an important way of trying to recover the ability to go to sleep. And there's some steps that we hope to put together with that. But David, thoughts? Yeah, the only, uh, great, the only things I would add is that, well, one is that, uh, of course, um, at least in our, in our deployed forces, sleep is a command responsibility. So we can tell individuals, hey, you need to get to sleep. And it, here are some steps you can take to improve your sleep. But it's really a leadership function to enforce that, uh, that leaders have to recognize that sleep is important to being able to get up and fight. Uh, so so we, it, it's one thing to tell the, the individual. It's another to try to consult to the leaders and, and inform them about the importance of sleep. And I think that's part of the role of being a, a, an expert and trying to help sustain the force. And then, you know, sleep is one of those pieces of self-care perhaps the most important piece, but self-care in an operational environment is important for everybody. And that means nutrition, that means hydration, that means physical exercise. There are other pieces of self-care that are uh, help sustain the, the fighting force. And so, uh, uh, sure, there are steps to improve sleep and trying to find a dark place, trying to find a, a mask to wear. Maybe those old COVID masks can go over your eyes now. Uh, you know, things, mm -hmm. things of that nature to try to Im improve the sleep environment. Um, certainly having somebody else in charge of safety is a very important step, but uh, sleep and self-care are really components of, of, uh, of staying uh, mentally and physically resilient in an operational environment. And when Dave refers to the masks, by the way, we now supply those to troops, sleep masks. I mean, it's not a trivial issue. Mm -hmm. Get something to go over your eyes, a critically important element. And I think on our website, Dave, I think we have up now the rare uh, sleep elements to help. So if you go to our website and go to the Ukraine link, I think you'll see the card up there that RARE provides in terms of leadership and individual activities to encourage sleep. Great point about the mask, though. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you, Bob, for these wise words on psychological first aid and to put you on the spot that quickly and that you responded to deliver this, this urgent uh, information that is ur of urgency for the people who are attending this call. You're going to stay on for this call. I mean, I'm always getting a little bit nervous if we have a 60 minute call instead of a 90 minute call. But so I want to turn it quickly to our next presenter um, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll familiar ourselves how we're going to do this. Actually, we, we sort of need to stop at the top of the hour, but we may for the audience who's with us extend a little bit over. Some of us have to leave, but if we tip over a little bit because of the topics that are going to be, going to be addressed tonight, then we're happy to do so. Uh, thanks again, Bob. Really, really appreciate it. And Dave, also on your end. And uh, Irina, you are going to um, introduce the, um, the second speaker. Yes, I would like to introduce a dear colleague of mine who is a um, uh, professor assistant at the Department of Medical Psychology, Psychosomatic Medicine and Psychotherapy 
at Bogomolets National Medical University in Kyiv, Ukraine. And he's a, as well a clinical psychologist at the Hospital of War Veterans, uh, named Forest Glade. Uh, it's the hospital under uh, authority of Minister of Health of Ukraine. And Dmitry has prepared uh, a clinical case and I will make some notes during his presentation and I will show uh, a, a slide or two after he will finish his presentation. Thank you, Rina. Thank you, Eric. Um, dear colleagues, first of all, thank you for the possibility to be there and to present this case. Um, these days, our hospital, uh, it uh, receives a lot of appeals from veterans for our cancer patients, uh, which, uh, with whom we have been in contact since 2014, since um, in the beginning of anti-terroristic uh, anti operation uh, in the east of Ukraine. And we would like to present a certain collective image of many cases, many clinical cases we are now uh, work with. And let's just uh, name this case, the case of Yaroslav. Yaroslav is a fictitious uh, veteran, but at the same time he absorbed, uh, he absorbed uh, many uh, cases we work with uh, and uh, many issues from our clinical practice. He's a veteran of warfare uh, in the Joint Forces operation. He served there in 2014 to 2015, then was demobilized. Uh, uh, but since 2015, he had persistent symptoms of TBI, traumatic brain injury, like traumas, head, uh, like headaches, like blood pressure, liability, cognitive impairment, and problems with sleep, yeah, uh, which he had uh, for more than eight years. Uh, quite often, he is unable to clearly identify his request, uh, although he periodically contacts us by himself, and uh, these contacts are in majority by um, by chat, by chatting, and very rarely by phone, because it's quite hard to make uh, even a short call. Uh, during the deployment. Uh, the main complaints of Yaroslav are anxiety, depression, and worries about uh, his family's safety. Um, uh, because we uh, can uh, only chat with him and very rarely to uh, make a call, uh, we are unable to analyze his facial expressions or his behavior, and we need to uh, make our, uh, make our um, um, make our conclusions just by uh, changes in how he is speaking, by changes in his lexicon, and it's quite hard to do, to be honest. Uh, another uh, issue is that no one from the psychological service of mm -hmm. armed forces of Ukraine spoke to him during and uh, after his uh, deployment, nor the psychologist did when he was hospitalized with the injuries because the psychological uh, service of armed uh, forces of Ukraine is um, overworking. It's, um, it, it requires many resources and cannot serve uh, everyone's need. Uh, if your slav is um, in more depressed state of mood, uh, of mood, he starts to talking about his past. He remembers the hospital, our hospital, how good it was there, and uh, he thinks that it, he would not get there soon. And uh, for us, helping to find the light in these dark times of the war can be difficult, uh, and sometimes it also can be difficult to find the right words uh, to him. Um, but when Yaroslav became, becomes calmer, he tries to, he tries to cheer us up. And for us, uh, this is a signal that he is okay. Uh, this indicates his attachment to us that we, and we try not to taboo this. Um, we can say to him that we are afraid or we are depressed and we believe that they need to know what is happening there and that there are people living and then there are people feeling. And uh, this clinical case uh, uncovers some several issues we are faced now, and to be honest, we didn't know how to deal with. Also, we can help him, Yaroslav, or any other our uh, veteran patient to overcome anxiety, to overcome pain, grief, fear, and worries about his loved ones. Situationally, our work for now lacks some sort of a system. And um, what can we do to overcome this, and what are the ways to make our work more systematic? Um, how to do 
uh, this how can we deal with this situation if uh, he was a veteran and we took care of him but now he is an armed force of ukraine uh, armed forces of ukraine and uh, he uh, is taking care is being under the care of ministry of defense and uh, what should we do about the consequences of tbi in veterans that are fighting against that are military servicemen again because uh, more than 80% um, of uh, demobilized uh, veterans uh, after um, operation in Donbas uh, had a TBI. And uh, we don't know if it um, somehow managed for now. Uh, how, is the, how is the psychological support uh, of the military during the hostilities should look like? And uh, we would be grateful uh to discuss this and uh, to share the ideas because this is quite an um, extraordinary issue that is going now and we uh, we are not fully prepared for this thank you thank you dmitro uh, and we would now have uh, about 20 minutes to discuss among us among experts uh this case uh, and tell me if you need uh, the one slide uh, of this clinical case, I would share the screen. Yeah, that'd be helpful, Irina, if you could do that. Do you need to um, I put it on multiple participants view? Yep. So you're calling to the audience to, um, to um, bring up any thoughts or comments, is that okay? Irina? Yes, yes, sure, sure. So, yeah, so, yeah no, let, let's go. We have a couple of people that we know on this call and, and maybe it's helpful for, um, for a few to, to call out to start, start out with. And maybe I can call on Rakesh, Rakesh Jetli, because he's with us. Hey, Rakesh, any, any thoughts immediately that would come up that you would like to share with this group? <laughs> yeah. Rakesh is not there. Maybe we can call on Emily. Emily Holmes. Hi. Thank you for the very nice case presentation. Um, what What is the um, just to try and understand the case better? What What does the patient see his most important difficulty at the moment of all the ones that he's described? Because there's 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 a lot here, and I'm wondering where he may be most motivated to start. Um, the, uh, the most uh, what is uh, disturbing the patient is uh, the fear about the safety of his, of, uh, his family and uh, um, some uh, periods of uh, anxiety and uh, depressive mood. It's coming, uh, it uh, goes off and it's coming again and something like this. Okay. Continue, Emily, if you wish, but I'd like to also call um, call maybe from our experts uh, who are Dave, Dave, and um, and Bob. If you if you have been able to listen into this case, Bob and Dave, any any thoughts or questions to Dimitru? Sure, well, uh, Dave, you want to start, and then I'll come. Sure, uh, I would uh, I note that sort of the the fear of what's going to happen to my family was was very common not only in, in service members but in our own healthcare forces uh, during COVID that uh, anxiety and concerns about uh, family safety uh, are uh, hugely important in in times of distress and I understand that the challenges of communication make these very difficult to resolve um, is so the but you know even in in our deployments, a phone call home, uh, a short phone call home can uh, sometimes be uh, established or a message to home or some way to connect with the family to get some word about that. So it's absolutely common for uh, service members and others in distressful situations separated from the family to be more worried about their family than themselves. And any kind of reassurance that can be uh, you know, it doesn't mean they have to talk every day, but a, some sort of a phone call, some sort of a, we will try to get word back to you and let you know how they're doing. If that's even doable, it, it, it would be a step in the right direction. Um, I just remember in my own uh, uh, deployment, 
I fought really hard to get a telephone line so that I could have my service members make a brief uh, a telephone call home, and it was very, very restorative just to hear the voice at the other end. Um, da David, hi, it's Rakesh. If I could jump in. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button when we changed the screen. I, I love what you're saying, and really nice to see you. I think one of the things that this rings home with is something that I think we've all talked about is in so North Rakesh, America. Rakesh is a retired colonel in the Canadian Armed Forces yeah. for the audience. To yeah. In North America, we've been spoiled and are very used to expeditionary wars, right? So, so in Canada, we often have this saying when we were in former Yugoslavia and Afghanistan that the Canadian Armed Forces is at war, but the country isn't. And it's when you go to visit places like Israel where you kind of say, okay, you're actually defending you know, your mothers, your daughters, your sisters while they're sleeping. And if you fail, you're going to fail. Your, your... So I think that's part of the you know, the, the, the European wars are often in their, in their real setting. So I think, I think for us, when we reach out to our families, it's, it's the reassurance. But here, unfortunately, there may not be the reassurance. And I think that's part of the, the challenge of, of not fighting expeditionary wars. And, and I think there's a whole different kind of mindset. And, and of course, that's what, you know, Israel faces and countries like that face. And that's what Ukraine is facing. Um, I, I like what Emily said in terms of, you know, what, what is the individual's goal, because it goes back a little bit to last week where, I mean, the ultimate goal here is to try to win the war, right? <laughs> that it's not about, so, so I think that's, again, I don't have an answer, but I think those are the questions as well, like, like, does he want reassurance that his family is safe, or does he want to be able to be an effective soldier, and, and because of his MTI, TBI and concussion, is he worried about, you know, how well he's going to be able to serve and, and execute the mission, so I think you know, really identifying the goals and helping him to achieve them where possible is there. If his family is not evacuated, they may not be safe. So how is he going to tolerate that uncertainty and still be productive? So I, I think it's it's an excellent case that gets us all thinking. And certainly, you know, for us, when we fight our wars, you know, like we just, one of our ships is sailing off to sort of help support Ukraine somehow, but it's still different than, you know, being in a ship in the Black Sea, right? So, so I think it's... Uh, it's a great it's, case, thank you. It, it is a very challenging situation when when the, sh the safety of the family cannot be uh, established. And I guess at that point, one of the things that might be helpful is to remind the service member that he's in fact fighting to restore yeah. the safety of his family. Exactly. To remind him yeah. to re redirect him towards the mission yeah. uh, to yeah. try to make safety where there isn't safety. Yeah. Yeah, so success, success of this overall mission is going towards collectively your family and every family being safer, yeah. So, so yeah, the answer depends on whether or not, say, if it's possible to find out that the family is evacuated, that's great and that will be very helpful. If it isn't, then a, a more global uh, yeah. or a more general statement about the importance of safety yeah. to everybody in this thing yeah. is uh, potentially useful. Yeah, and, 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 the you're, other... and you're, you're part of a military community that's trying to help, help make... keep everybody's family safe. I might add a couple of quick broad comments uh, to Rakesh and Dave's very wise comments. Um, just bullet points, PTSD and TBI, bad combination. Um, but if you get a TBI, there's a good chance you'll get PTSD. PT if you get PTSD, you don't necessarily have TBI. Uh, but if you've gotten a TBI, it may well have been because you were in a dangerous setting. Secondly, is PTSD and TBI are both uh, associated with increased risk for suicide that we haven't talked about. And suicide can come in many forms. It can come as what looks like a heroic act, but sometimes when it's suicidal, it can be a heroic act that actually puts your colleagues at risk. Um, so being sure to address the question of keeping oneself safe. In the setting of acute response, um, Dave will recognize some of the phrasing here, uh, being alert to the experience of futility and despair, that when a soldier or anyone is experiencing futility, meaning giving up, or despair, meaning absence of hope, then the question of suicide risk and also ability to perform are critical. So I'd think about ways to recover the person, regardless from the diagnosis, but to recover them from the experience of despair. Now, a very specific issue, which I thought was a marvelous comment you made, uh, which was that 
he likes to cheer us up. So as clinicians, we frequently look for illness, wrong. Even outside of war, but particularly in war, we have to look for islands of health. Where is the island of health that we can build on? Not where's the disorder? And in this person, you've mentioned an island of health. When he is cheering us up, he's more grounded, he's more with us. I would find ways to expand that. I would talk to him about cheering us up. What's that like for you? How are you going to do that when you go back? You know, your job is to cheer up your unit. How are you going to do that? That's an amazing skill that you have. You can cheer us up when we're feeling down. How do you do that? Where'd you learn that? How are you going to do it when you go back? Tell me about that. Build him out of despair by helping him recognize that tremendous skill of cheering others up. It's an amazing skill to have. And that is truly an island of health. And then lastly, I just comment, as you mentioned, the symptoms of depression and the worry about, as I said, despair and suicide. Remember that in the, in the world outside of war, when the DSM-5 was created in the United States, there was a whole new chapter. That chapter puts PTSD into the cha chapter of trauma and stress-related disorders. It's no longer in the anxiety disorders chapter. Why is that important? It says there are more than PTSD that comes about due to trauma events. There are now, we know, numbers of disorders and psychological responses related to trauma experience. And your case illustrates depression as one of those. And we know that that can occur. We know panic disorder is also associated with trauma exposure. So when we think about someone who's exposed to a traumatic event and you're actually needing to make a diagnosis rather than deal with rapid recovery, remember that the diagnoses aren't only PTSD and that will frame our treatments as well. But again, I, I like thinking about the despair response and looking for islands of health, which that's a marvelous example. And I'd love to see you write up even hypothetically, how does one build on someone who wants to cheer us up? How can I make that island become a continent for this person? Thank you. That, thank you for those words, uh, Bob. Islands of health. Maybe I may call on Great Deep from Norway in Oslo. Great, if you're with us and you'd like to share some thoughts that you, um, you have uh, for this occasion. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Yeah, I'm currently in Colorado, so okay. in the US and in a big snowstorm at the moment. So a little bit far away from Ukraine, but I keep in touch with my colleague in Oslo, preparing for taking in, uh, yeah, I think a lot about 100,000 refugees in the coming weeks. And our concern is not so much military related, but these are families also of military personnel coming in and uh, having had a, a horrible situation. And we expect that at least the children um, have seen and experienced things that they have difficulties in coping with. So we are a little bit um, wearing around on how to prepare uh, professionals for this and, and make a good structure and implementation of uh, psychological first aid and the other issues that we need to focus on. And um, after the COVID, you know, there's a lot of issues going on in society and a lot of lack of professionals also in a society like Norway. Uh, so it's also, very important that the things we do now is building on people's own resources. And as uh, Bob Ursan said, the, the islands of, of health is very important, I think. Uh, so um, I have some contact with Irana uh, and hope that you can help us, Irana, also in the further work that we do. And I hope that more European communities can work together in, in how we respond to this. And uh, at least the, the mental health professionals that we think similarly and, and that we help each other in thinking good thoughts and, and efficient thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, great. And before we reach back to the intro,
Cât mai durează? I just muted. Let, let's before we reach out to Dimitri, uh, Dimitri again. Let's call on um, Yana Shakashvili, who's also with us from Tbilisi, Georgia. Could you unmute yourself, uh, Yana, and and share your observation? Thank you, Greta, for being with us and sharing your um, your thoughts. Appreciate it. Yana, are you with us? Yeah, yes, I'm here. Thank you, Eric. Um, so th this fascinating case. Uh, actually, Bob, Bob told this may thing because we, we are building on uh, strong uh, protective factors. And the fact that the guy is trying to be in touch, uh, that's so important, you can build on that. But it's also a parallel process. Probably his family is similarly um, nervous about him. And he is similarly nervous about his family. So that's a meeting point also. Probably that's something which resonates. And probably it's something to normalize also. Because, yeah, that's, that's so normal uh, to feel anxious when, when it's such a situation. Um, yeah. And yeah, actually, uh, if, if Dmitro, you, you have very particular question regarding this case, it will be more easier to us to, to, uh, to, to advise. W what is your particular question? Let's go back to Dimitro. And, and Dimitro, you've heard, thank you for sharing that, Jana, from Tbilisi. Uh, Dimitro, when you've heard all these thoughts and observations, any thoughts to synthesize this or just reflections on your end? Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your thoughts, for your ideas, because it's, yeah, it's very important. Um, and uh, I, I, I will pronounce what uh, is the question we face, is how to act with this um, military servicemen, because quite often they even uh, cannot say what they want from us. They just want a support, but they uh, don't want what kind of support they want from us. And it's also um, it's also an issue from us how to manage, how to guess what they want from us and what we can be useful and how we can be useful for them now in this short period by chat and uh, in the war when everything is uh, going with the nowhere. And uh, yes, thank you. Very important issue about islands of health, about some positive issues, about some grounding issues, and uh, normalizing uh, the family uh, worries. This is very important for us. I'm certain uh, Bob, Bob has some reflections. Bob, this islands of hope is something that really anchors within Dimitro. And any any additional thoughts that you could get? Because my 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 sort of bridging question is: you said it's not a face to face connection that you always have. You also have a sort of a, a bot connection or a digital connection, if I hear that correctly, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because we cannot cover uh, everyone, we cannot cover every issues. So we uh, created the bot. Uh, we created a bot, a Telegram bot, uh, with uh, some self-help techniques and uh, they can use this bot to uh, help uh, to self-help uh, and to help one another because this bot also have some techniques uh, how to help uh, your um, how to help your mate during the war uh, but yes this is partially helped us and partially covered uh, our needs but um, any bot cannot uh, uh, or change the leave contact, the contact with the person. So the, the question maybe to you, Bob, is this psychological first aid, how can we digitally bring them to a, 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 an arena for, um, for help? Some of them need to be brought face to face, but some could also be communicated over, over other ways of communication. Any, any thoughts on your sure. end? Yeah, uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity, Eric. And as you know, I'll have to leave about four for another meeting I have. But I think David will stay on and uh, he yeah. knows more than I do at any rate. So I'm all glad to always salute it off to him. Um, I, I'm not totally sure about the bot issue, but I guess what I would take away from adding to a bot, I never thought of putting into a psychological first aid, digital aid, cheer someone up. Mm -hmm. But I think it is a marvelous idea. Don't just say calm, 
don't just say take care of yourself who can you cheer up um, and if i were digitally in contact with him through text messages which i think is centrally important to the extent one can do it whether it's during a war or not can be a tremendous experience to experience an outreach from someone to them and i would ask him who did you cheer up today to again build on this concept of it makes him more grounded brings him back to life when he can cheer someone up and i'm going to add that to my repertoire of helping other people who have you cheered up today thank you eric for the opportunity to be here and i'll put my email in the chat and glad to continue to correspond and chat with people as it may always, be helpful always appreciated your your help and your wise words bob thanks for being here with us tower and look forward to the next opportunity um, just just on, on, on one note, maybe it's a thought that comes up now, and I'll put it in the chat too. There's a, a Canadian colleague, and Rakesh, Rakesh, you may know him as well. He's called Vincent Ayapong, and he created something that's called Text for Hope, T-E-X-T, -E and then the number yeah. four, Hope. Maybe you could speak to that, Rakesh. It is a, an amazingly yeah, simple... I'll, yeah, I'll, I, have to, I have to drop off in a second as well. So, so what I can do is I can... Send, so basically, it's a... I mean, it's an evidence-based system and I, I actually signed up for it because they wanted our, our military members to use it. And basically there's two aspects, there's an overall well-being wellness, and then there's a specific PTSD one. And literally once a day, you get this simple text and the text has phrases that are sort of, you know, positive phrases or just general phrases. And then often there's a link to literature or PDF or something like that. And, um, and, it, and there's evidence that it does actually help people. It engages them. It, it gives them a togetherness. And so, so I don't know if, yeah, we, if we have it, it's simple to sign. I don't know what the international way it works, but, but in Canada, it's a very simple text. Like, but it go, it's, not, it's not on any of the other platforms like WhatsApp, as far as I know, but it's simply texting. So it might, there might be a cost involved like from a, from a you know, cell phone perspective, but very simple, very, you know, and we had, we had other things in the days where, you know, postcards for suicidal people after discharge. So, I mean, I think sometimes we may overcomplicate the things that we offer. So, so there are simple things like that, that, I mean, again, there's an evidence in the literature behind this one that shows it helps people sort of in, in from a wellness slash well-being perspective and there's a mental health and then there's a PTSD specific one. So I, I do have to hop, but Eric, you, you know, yep. like Su Suzette and some of the folks can share, can share the literature on this with people. Yep. I, I put the uh, Vincent Ayapong text for hope. In the okay. Chat. But perfect. Just, thanks Dimitrov. for reaching out. Joseph, Joseph Zohar. Yeah. Dimitrov, yeah. I, I, I can uh, you know, share with you some of our experience, which is similar and not similar, but there was some similarity from what we went through. And basically, you know, the uh, expectation. This is sort of connected to what Bob Versano was saying. Uh, the, I, so the ex putting emphasis on the expectation that you go back and you do whatever you uh, had intended to do originally and encourage the people to go back. And this is sort of strengthening up and uh, putting them back uh, in the unit that they were there, this is very important. Not just going back to any unit, but going back to the unit that they were belonging to, it's very important. And the other thing that, you know, part of what we are doing and we used to do in the past and we are doing it now to some extent is making sure about the com com communication. So, you know, part of the supply is not just the physical supply, food and so on, but also opening the, and I think it should be clear to, to the commander that giving time to talk with the family and uh, uh, encourage the, you know, the soldiers to, to take some time to talk with the family, it's going to be very useful. And, uh, you know, basically every war, uh, you know how it starts, you don't know how it's going to end. This is the nature of the war, and this is what we have been going through. 
you know, uh, I can encourage you that we manage to do it. And I'm sure that you will manage to do it well too. Thanks, Joseph. Thanks, Joseph. I'd like to do the following. I'd like to start wrapping up. But before doing so, we have Kate Porcheret with us, if I'm correct, and then reach out to you, Kate. You were with us in Odessa too. So I'd like to also give you the opportunity to express your thoughts or opinions and then go back to Jana. She raised her hand, David, and then back probably to you, Irina. And then we should be close to uh, wrapping this up for tonight. Kate, you want to speak up? Uh, yeah, I... Uh... See you, Kate. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, it's been so interesting. Um, Where listen. are you located now, Kate? Could you say? Uh, so? I'm actually in Oslo now. I'm working with Greta Dib. Uh, so that was actually a, uh, an outcome of our meeting in Odessa as well. So that was great. Um, yeah, it's been it's been really interesting hearing what everyone's saying. I'm not sure how much I can sort of really add, but obviously emphasizing the importance of sleep and being able to to get some sort of sleep. Um, in any way will will be hugely uh, beneficial. My, I did just have one slight thought um, from the case study, and I don't know whether it is feasible in this situation, but maybe people can try and do a little video messaging, um, even if you're not able to do direct face-to-face -face conversations, maybe being able to just send a video message, even if just um, briefly might be something else that would help in that situation. Um, especially if you are wanting to get more of a sense of how someone is uh, feeling. Perhaps that's easier than just through text. Um, but other than that, I don't think um, I have anything uh, hugely to add, just to say that, um, yeah. This is pretty clear and get everyone. Yeah, thanks. thanks for being with us also, Kate. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, Victor, we won't forget you either. No, um, uh, Jana first, you should raise your hand, and then um, uh, Victor, and then uh, David, uh, if I'm not mixing up the order. Uh, Jana? Uh, she has disappeared, probably some. Oh, yes. the connection's lost. Then we go to Victor, Victor Spormacher from the Max Planck Institute in Munich. Yeah, thanks a lot, Eric, uh, and Irina for organizing this and for the, the interesting case. All the all the tips we had. I, there's one thing that uh, that that keeps kind of bugging me because we've been hearing a lot about um, what to do with military personnel. You know, they should go back into action, back to their units. But now we have all of these like really brave civilians taking up arms. What I'm kind of wondering about is is should we like, is, is the goal to re-engage them, you know, or should we say, hey, if you're having severe acute stress responses, you know, that there's, there's maybe weeks ago, maybe months ago, it's going to be guerrilla, I don't know, warfare. So it wouldn't be better to reassign people on the basis also of this to maybe say, okay, there's also lots of important things to do in military intelligence or so. Just, just you know, wondering there, because of what, what, what is pretty well known is, okay, what to do with soldiers who are trained, sure, they should go back, but civilians taking up arms is, of course, a different uh, topic. Yeah, yeah, very important topic. Um, um, Irina, I see you nod, so, so maybe you want to say something on, on, on Victor's note. I'm just making notes what next uh, topics we would have uh, and we would definitely need to address uh, those issues so we already planned to have if you don't mind i will just uh, a bit uh, uh, disclose you what our future plan like for future plans for the next hold, meeting. Hold, hold on for one second because i then i reach out to david first and i'll and, and then we go back to you and dimitro yeah, David, I saw you not as well so give sure. you a, you just a couple of thoughts with the question of the bot uh, I don't have much experience or any experience with the bot, but it would seem to me that it, it would be helpful to address this person in his prior military rank. He's now back in a military environment, or at least if the bot allows for that, to sort of reorient him uh, to the to the current mission by by uh, using a military um, terminology whenever possible, since he's being asked to be in a in a military uh, role, if, if in fact the plan is for him to continue to, to, to fight. And so the, the sort of the extent to which the bot can be um, adopt a military uh, a, a tone uh, might be helpful. Uh, we, we made it, we made okay. it. 
So very Zippy. good. Let's see, you know more. I like so good, and hopefully that is helpful. Uh, the other one, other issue is because this person has um, a history of traumatic brain injury. This, some degree of being able to to speak with his commander to uh, to alert the commander to the potential difficulties that might result from that in terms of. Uh, uh, impulsivity or difficulty attending to task, so that the commander isn't wondering if this person is, you know, just uh, trying to get out of things. Some communication with the command might be helpful. I did like the idea of uh, also that was just mentioned by Kate about, you know, not real time messaging. So Facebook is stable. Facebook, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't have anything invested in Facebook, but you know, using messenger products where there could be, you know. Asynchronous communication uh, yeah. might be helpful in yeah. his circumstance, again, if the family is in fact safe, so that periodically he could get those reminders uh, or, or at, at least uh, be encouraged to send them in an effort to cheer up his family, even if they wouldn't hear them. So those are just some additional thoughts that I uh, had. A very tricky, very difficult circumstance to have a former service member be with, with those uh, challenges reintegrated into to, to the mission. And I, I uh, echo the challenge of what do you do with civilians who aren't trained service members who are now taking up arms. Um, I think one of the things we you have to think about is, uh, at least as for service members, you have to think about the guilt of, of leaving comrades. And so reassignment, at least with military members, is a, is a bit of a, we try to uh, keep them with their units. Uh, it's, a, it's a different question with civilians, perhaps, but it would be one to be discussed when such decisions were making. Uh, how do you feel about uh, the people that you've been working with and, and what might happen if you leave? Thank you. I see, I see that we also, thank you really, Dave. We all, I also see that we have Yael Daniele from New York on this call. This is really touching that we have so many from global outreach people that are on this call is really appreciated. Um, um, now, uh, first, Dimitro, you wanted to say something on on just your perception. Then we'd like to give it to Irina, uh, because we're we're at ten minutes over the hour. Don't want to extend it too long, and we'll go mm -hmm. on with more sessions to follow. So we don't have to do everything at once, but we have many more sessions that we will be able to guide you through and educate you with expert consultations. And maybe Dimitro, just a few a few words on your end. Yeah, the main issue I would like to say is thank you. Thank you all because uh, every support is important and uh, we really appreciate every support, every idea because we hope and uh, we believe that this will uh, help us to reach our victory in this war and this will help us to save our soldiers in any cases. All right, Dimitro, keep on. Irina. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Dmitro has not uh, mentioned, but he told me that they've created uh, chats, uh, group chats with the veterans, and I think this may as well serve as a uh, connection uh, with uh, friends and colleagues. So um, I'm really glad that we have this uh, slightly different uh, mode of uh, uh, our meetings, like we have an expert talk and then a clinical case, and we will proceed with this um, uh, uh, format. And uh, just today I've received uh, uh, a request to cover uh, the topic of using benzos of, and prescription of benzos, because right now uh, family doctors prescribe benzos for sleep problems, which are of course very common for months which is of course a, is an issue. And uh, another uh, topic we would like to cover as well is the debriefing. We have started this discussion last time, but uh, hopefully we will have an expert giving us a clear distinction between like when it should be or should not be uh, uh, applied and uh, in which circumstances. Uh, and of course, uh, there is a uh, 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 urgent need to cover the topic of child, uh, child uh, children uh, trauma as well. Uh, and so thank you, Victor, for, for another issue. And we will try to look for an expert in a clinical case, probably about that. 
And of course, uh, uh, members of uh, today's meeting and our traumatic stress network are welcome to send their uh, clinical cases or uh, questions that uh, you would like to be discussed uh, within future meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. And, and in closing, uh, I wanted to thank um, Dimitro for bringing on this case from, from the Ukraine and the uncertainty that you are and that the ability to connect with us. Dave Benedict for reaching out to us and being here and, and also Bob who had to leave unfortunately a little bit earlier. Um, and all the people who participate in this. And I'd like to pin you and call on you. And it's wonderful that you then share your, your thoughts and opinions. It feels that we're globally connected. We all have a passion to what's going on there. It'll not stop after you pay, push the end, end of this call meeting. Life will go on, the war will go on. So with that, we have an urgency to readdress these issues in two weeks. We typically would do this every three months, but we said, let's do it in two weeks. Probably we'll reach out or hopefully we'll reach out to Jonathan Bisson who just published this wonderful paper on debriefing. If we cannot get John Bisson next in two weeks, we'll reach out to Arik Shalev or vice versa. Arik Shalev has written a beautiful paper on resiliency. So um, he has been populating that on our uh, website. So uh, stay, stay tuned. We'll inform you if you wish on the, uh, on the LinkedIn or other social media. Um, and uh, any final word from your end, Yossi or, or Irina? Uh. I think it is very useful and uh, I would like to thank Irena and all the participants for, for helping us to carry it through. And uh, hopefully, Timitro, the text was helpful for you and for the other listener. And we'll keep doing it in, in order to help you and help uh, the people in Ukraine to uh, have better life in the future.